you can't mourn the losses for too long because business keeps moving, time keeps moving. There all there's always going to be another need. So while you're sulking in the corner, you know there are other opportunities that are potentially missed. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Today's episode is brought to you by Gusto. Gusto offers modern, easy payroll benefits and HR to small businesses across the country. They were even named Best Online Payroll by PC Mag. And as a Side Hustle Pro listener, you will get three months free when you run your first payroll. So sign up and give it a try at gusto.com slash SHP. That's gusto.com slash SHP. Hey, hey, guys, welcome back to the show. Today in the guest chair, we have former Wall Street analyst turned founder and CEO, Melissa Butler. Melissa is a visionary who challenges the standard of beauty through the products, pricing, and ingredients in her brand, The Lip Bar. You may have come across The Lip Bar since it's become somewhat of a celebrity fave, shared by the likes of Taraji P. Henson on Instagram, and it's now sold in select Target stores. But before there was Target, there was just Melissa and her business partner squeezed into a tiny bedroom in Brooklyn. Melissa launched The Lip Bar from her kitchen, She describes her move from stocks and bonds to beauty as a natural one, not because she loved makeup, but because she was just frustrated with the beauty industry and ready to create a solution. Not only that, but she was tired of the harsh chemicals in ordinary cosmetics. So she created the Lip Bar, which is a vegan and cruelty-free product line. On today's show, Melissa shares why she was passionate about disrupting the narrative on beauty and passionate about creating a line of cosmetics that are safe and affordable. Let's get right into it. So welcome to the guest chair, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor, a pleasure. So talk to us a little bit about your personal story. Who was Melissa as a young girl? Um, you know, honestly, I'm the same person as I was when I was a kid. I was always like the fearless person, the rebel, the person who talked back, the person who didn't really take no for an answer. And that's who I am today. But like as a kid, you know, you grow up thinking that everything that you do is okay, And then when you become an adult, then you get criticized for some of it. So as I've gotten older, I started thinking about like my aggressive personality, like, oh, you probably shouldn't have done that. But as a kid, you're just like, this is it. You don't even second guess, you know, who you are, what you're doing. But yeah, I was definitely the inquisitive child. So I wanted to learn. I was really hungry for knowledge. But also because of that hunger for knowledge, like I started learning a lot of things. And so I became like this know-it-all, like little miss know-it-all who asked a ton of questions so that I can then go and like share my knowledge with the rest of, you know, either my classmates or my family members or my cousins or, (laughs) you know, whatever the case may be. But yeah, that's that's who I was as a kid. And I think that's pretty much who I still am. That's so interesting. So Little Miss Know-It-All, what did Little Miss Know-It-All want to do when she grew up? Oh, God, I had so many like dream professions. Um, At one point, I wanted to be a doctor because I'm a fighter. So like I'm like an arguer. Um, I'm like the great debater, but I'm actually not even good at it, to be (laughs) honest. (laughs) So it started, I wanted to be a lawyer and then I wanted to be a heart surgeon. And then I wanted to be a sports agent. I'm not even into sports, but remember that movie, Jerry Maguire? Yes. So I was so into it. And so I'm like, that's what I want to do. I didn't, I'm, I'm not even into sports. And then when I went to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to make money. So when I actually went to college, I ended up studying business finance because I knew that people on Wall Street made a lot of money. And so that was my goal. Like, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to live the American dream. Like, I'm going to make money and I'm going to get a family and buy a house and blah, blah, blah. So I was I was definitely chasing the bag. 
you know, that's such a, a common theme. Like we as people of color, we go to school, we're like, okay, what pays the highest? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I was backwards. I didn't think about that. I was like, oh, I want to pursue my passions. But okay. <laughs> so and you- I went to FAMU and FAMU has a, an incredible business program, also an incredible pharmacy school. But like as it relates to, to FAMU's business school, everyone is kind of in competition and like the faculty, they encourage competition. So they'll tell you in a heartbeat, like, oh, such and such got a job offer from Procter and Gamble and they're making 110,000. So like it creates this culture and this atmosphere of like true, like black excellence, like, oh, they did this. Okay. Well now I have to do this. Like, oh, such and such got an internship with Citibank. Okay. Now I got to go get one with Goldman Sachs. So wow. like that was the competitive nature at FAMU. And I love that university so much for creating that. Now, once you graduated, how long did you work in that finance, investment banking kind of world before getting out? <laughs> yeah, I worked on Wall Street for a full four years. At year two is when I started the Lit Bar. And so I always tell people, like, I didn't start the Lit Bar because I was passionate about makeup. Even to this day, I tell people I'm not passionate about makeup, but I am passionate about making women feel like they are enough and reminding them that beauty doesn't have to be transformational. So like for years, the beauty industry say like beauty looks like this one specific thing. And basically you need to strive towards this, this particular look in order to be accepted by society. And so when I started the lip bar, it was like, I hated that idea. I hated that cosmetics were filled with a lot of unnecessary chemicals. And I I hated the lack of diversity. So like me starting the lip bar at year two of like my career on Wall Street was number one, because like people were miserable. So I worked at Barclays and I graduated in like 2008, the end of 2008. So this is like the height of the crash and like the real estate crisis. And so, you know, the the morale on Wall Street was just like, it was extremely low. So I had my coworkers basically coming to work, complaining every day, hating their job. And so I'm like, well, I don't want this to be me. I don't want this to be my life. Fast forward 15 years, me just coming and collecting a check. I'm like, I'm young. I don't, I don't have to be in this position. So, you know, I started the company, but not really knowing. I decided that I was going to start a company before really making the the decision on what that company would be. I just knew I was going to be an entrepreneur. I'm like, I got to get out. (laughs) Yes. Now, what you are describing is side hustling, which is exactly what, you know, I encourage people to do. Right. Like, yeah. You know, test it out, dip your toe into it and figure it all out. And you also raise another really important point about. The fact that what you're doing is not related to some quote unquote passion that we feel like we have to do the thing that we would love to do every day. But you tapped into a need and kind of wanting to have an impact. Can you talk a little bit more about how you landed on cosmetics, though, instead of, let's say, hair or body products? Well, so again, like you just said, like there was a need. So like I grew up in Detroit, where the standard of beauty is light skin, long hair. There are thousands of light skin, long hair women in the city of Detroit. And so that's kind of like what the boys would flock to in middle school and in high school. And so if you were an outlier, you kind of like, we're like, oh, wait, there's no representation for me. And so I landed on beauty because at that time I was taking a more holistic approach to my lifestyle. So I started using more natural products. I stopped eating um, chicken and turkey. Um, I already wasn't eating beef and pork, but I started like actually thinking about like who I was as a woman, things that I was allowing into my mind, my body, my spirit, et cetera. And so I'm like using more natural products because it's like, why not? So when it came to food, it was very easy to find like more natural or organic substitutes. Same thing with hair care. It was very easy to find hair care, body care, skin care that was on the more natural side or just had any sort of like wellness aspect. But when it came to makeup, it didn't really exist. So when I wanted to shop for a natural or any sort of makeup product that had um, an ingredient claim, it was like horrible colors, like boring colors, like 
everything was just mauve. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I don't want to wear this. I live in New York City. I'm 20, 24, 25 years old. You know, I kind of want to be seen a little bit when I go outside. So like, where are the color options? So it was like a matter of like me saying like, wait, beauty shouldn't have to compromise your health. But also, like, where is the diversity in the beauty industry? Like, why is it that now as an adult, there's still this standard of beauty that that everyone was flocking towards? So when I first started the lip bar, everybody wanted to look like Kim Kardashian. Mm. Like every everything was Kim Kardashian. And it's so interesting that six years later, you know, and now it's like everyone is looking like her little sister. And it's like they're still they have a stronghold on like what this beauty industry looks like. But I felt like that wasn't representative of me and a lot of my friends. And so I was like, okay, well, if you can't beat them, join them and change it from within. So like that was my goal in getting into cosmetics because I really wanted to create representation and make sure that other brown girls growing up in a city like Detroit who weren't you know, light skin with long hair so that they could actually grow up and believe like, you know, what, I am beautiful and I don't have to be light skin in order to be considered attractive or I don't have to have, you know, my hair a certain way or, you know, even be a certain weight or shape, etc. I love that. I love what you stand for and the fact that, you know, your brand is founded on beliefs and a true mission statement and not just, you know, oh, I just want to make cosmetics and and different lipstick colors. Now, yeah, you'll never last. People come to me all the time like, you know, um, can you give me advice? I want to start an eyelash company. And I'm like, well, why do you want to start an eyelash company? They're like, well, because I love lashes. So what? (laughs) So (laughs) that's not enough because like, here's the thing. Business is very trendy right now. Everyone thinks it's super easy. People think it's just dressing up and taking pictures on Instagram. And while that has worked for some people, that's not sustainable. That's not going to get you through the tough days. Like there were many occasions where I probably should have given up based on like just looking at the numbers, like we weren't making money or things were tough or I was just ill-equipped, didn't have proper staffing, didn't have proper funding, but I decided to keep going in lieu of all of that because I really believed in what I was doing. So just believing that you like eyelashes, you know, that's not enough to like sustain a business when it gets, when it gets difficult and it's always difficult. That's what entrepreneurs, um, I think quickly learn after they launch. Yes. So talk to us about these early years while you're still working at Barclays and you are doing this on the side. I'm curious to know how you even learned to make lipstick. (laughs) Was that through like YouTube? (laughs) It was it was YouTube. It was Google. It was reading books on cosmetic chemistry. It was a lot of experimenting. It was stalking cosmetic chemists. Like I was doing everything. I took like the omni channel approach. So I have a bit of an obsessive personality. So it's not addictive because like everything is fleeting. So I think that's the difference between obsession and addiction. So I have an obsessive personality where if I'm into something like I am going to ride that wave until it no longer serves me. And so I became addicted to like figuring out how to create this formula. Like I didn't really want to sleep and I'm not from the camp of like, oh, you need to stay up all night and grind because that's not healthy. And I sleep eight hours every night. But um, I was like so determined to like create this formula that I was like, I was just so driven by it. So like I literally took every single approach possible to like learn about cosmetic chemistry and carrier oils and essential oils. And then like chemicals that were in, in products. I was reading the backs of cosmetics that I would use or that were popular learning every single ingredient. Like, well, what does this do? Like, what does this add to that final formula? Like, does it improve the texture? Does it, is it an emollient? Does it add moisture? And it's really because I, I was, I was, I was obsessed with it. I just knew that, you know, if I could learn as much as possible, then I would put myself in a better situation as it relates to like launching this business or even just being knowledgeable about it. Yes. So when we launched in 2012, you know, vegan and cruelty free and like people think about natural things in like a positive light right now, because now we're like 
oh, the world is trying to kill us with the chemicals and it's giving us cancer. But in 2012, you know, and when I would say it's vegan and cruelty free or natural, people would immediately give me a side eye like, well, does it work? (laughs) (laughs) So there was like this education because people thought that chemical meant, you know, it meant that it was going to be great. Whereas like now people are like, oh, I don't want those chemicals. You know, I'm reading the backs of the (laughs) ingredients. But yeah, I just I wanted to be able to speak to the customer from like an educational standpoint. So I had to learn as much as possible and just to even validate why why I needed to start this business. And that's why I personally really appreciate what you're building, because um, a fun fact about me, well, not that much fun to experience it, but I actually have (laughs) eczema. And so my skin is really sensitive and I will randomly I need to get an allergy test at some point, but I will randomly, you know, have a breakout on my cheek and have no idea what causes it. And once you throw away your foundation box, your lip gloss box, you have no idea what's in these products. And yeah. You have no idea what's even causing your reaction. So, you know, the fact that you are creating products that are helpful and not harmful to our skin is a huge Huge. thing. And I, you know, give you kudos for that. And they work and they're beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yeah, it's it's, it was tough. It was tough to get people to, to understand that it's okay to go for like the natural option. So now let's talk about this leap. When did you know you had an idea worth betting on and, you know, it was time to leave your job and go full time on this? So everyone is different, right? People always like want to know like when they should leave their job. And I don't think there's a magic formula for it. I don't think there's a certain day for me. I quit my corporate job because I just decided, you know what? I think I have something here. We were getting press very early on and people seemed interested, but I didn't quit because the lip bar was making a ton of money. I quit simply because I was like, you know what? This is very low risk for me. If I quit and focus on it, I'll know that I gave it my all because you can't expect your business to give you 100% if you don't give it 100%. So I'm like, okay, well, If I quit, what's the worst that could happen? I'm like 25, 26 years old living in New York, but I have a degree and now I have experience on Wall Street. I don't have any kids. I'm not married. You know, I don't know a better time that I should take this risk. So for me, it was like a, okay, if you fall flat on your face, it's fine. You you can survive. And I know a lot of people don't have that luxury. Um, I saved up what I thought would be I think a year, a year's worth of expenses. I think it lasted seven months instead of a year. And so there were times where I couldn't pay my rent. There were times where me and my creative director, we Airbnb. Uh, so we had a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment in Brooklyn. And I loved it so much. But like there were times where we were just like poor. And so we we Airbnb her room and then she moved into my room. So like for maybe three months, like we're sleeping in the bed together and all of her shit is in my room (laughs) and we have no room. Like we're literally suitcase on top of suitcase because like she just moved basically her whole life into my bedroom. And so like there were times that I had to deal with that, but I didn't give up because ultimately I'm like, you know what? I believe in this. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep going even though it's not yielding the results that I need in the immediate. So I kind of had the foresight to say, But this is what small business is. This is what entrepreneurship is. And right now it's tough. And if you're going to quit at the first sign of like of trouble at the first big hurdle, then you shouldn't have been an entrepreneur anyway. Wow. Snaps to that. Now, this creative director, was she like, did you guys come up with this at the same time or did you kind of bring her on board as you went forward? I, I brought her on board. So she's been around basically since day one. But the lip bar was my baby that I dreamt up in my apartment, in my bed. I think it was cold in New York and I didn't want to leave my house. And then also I was just like, I don't want to go to work on Monday. (laughs) So (laughs) what does that look like? Like, how can I build this life for myself where I can get everything that I want? And so the lip bar ended up being it. Okay. And you touched on the yield not being exactly what you wanted when you started out. What were you doing to, you know, take the lip bar from the idea to a business and get marketing and build awareness? So, 
your network, you know, everything is going to start with you. So it's like your family and your friends. Um, and you can't be afraid to share your story or share your idea. So basically I saved up all of my little money and I was like, I'm going to use it to start this business. So I invested in the product initially. And so to this day, we really haven't invested in marketing. We don't have a marketing budget. So everything has been really organic and just us doing innovative things to really connect with the customer on that level where it's like, we're relatable. I know my customer because I am my customer kind of thing. And so like that has always been our approach to business and like serving our customer the best way by really listening to them, giving them a voice, giving them a platform while also saying like, you know what, we understand your needs and and we're going to put you first. So that was really our marketing by producing things and letting our customer know that we were here for them. Got you know, it, it wasn't like a self-serving thing. And I think that's what business is in general. Like when you think about like why Amazon does so well, it's not because like it's the best user experience or anything. It's just out of convenience. Like people love Amazon because it's convenient. And so like it's serving that customer in a need where it's like, okay, well, from the beauty perspective, my customer, when I first launched, we had 12 crazy colors. <laughs> and so for me, the need was, okay, well, makeup only comes in like reds, pinks, and nudes. But what about that customer who wants to express herself outside of that? So we were launching like blues and pinks and yellow green like we had every color of the rainbow because I'm like beauty shouldn't be linear it shouldn't be only these three shades and then I'm like well our very next few colors that we launched we launched like six nudes and like tomorrow we're actually about to release more nudes and the the name of that campaign is never enough nudes so we I think we currently have like 12 nudes in our in our current assortment But the reality is it's still not enough because, you know, are we really serving all of our customers? Are we making it more convenient for our customer to not have to mix three different shades and a lip liner to get her perfect nude? So it's really just always thinking about how can I best serve the customer and make their life a little bit easier? Yes. And, you know, highlighting the customer, I'm so glad you brought that up because it truly is the critical point of marketing. Whenever people reach out to me for marketing advice, I'm like, well, who is your target? Who, do you know her? Have you have you gotten to know her? Like what research have you done? Uh, because that person should have a name, a face that you you know her hobbies, you know her age, all of that stuff. Yeah. So what kind of innovative things were you doing though? I mean, I got to drill down a little bit more because people are going to be like, how, how did she, other than her network, how did you expand it so that the likes of, you know, I now see it on Kalana Barfield and my leak and all these people who are obsessed with that perfect red that you guys have. Um, I think it's honestly, I think it's the storytelling, but then also just remembering that we were small. So As a small business owner, you always want to like dream big and do these big things. I think especially if you have any sort of CPG business, you think like, oh, I want a store to sell that product. So I think a lot of people like if you had like an online boutique, you're like fantasizing about that day where you can have like people in your dressing rooms. And so like I was from a similar um, mindset where it's like, okay, well, I want a store, but not necessarily from that fantasy perspective, but just from the idea of beauty is extremely intimate. People want to try it on. It goes on your face, you know? And so I knew that we weren't ready for a retail store. I also knew that we weren't ready for like a big player, like a Sephora or Alta. And so the most innovative thing we've done to date, in my opinion, is we built out the lip bar truck. And so the lip bar truck is basically, we took the idea of a food truck and we completely converted it. So it's literally a, a beauty store on wheels. So lights, mirrors, displays, you can sit there. We threw parties on there. Like you and 10 of your friends could come on the truck and drink champagne. And, and we went on a tour and I have a whole new respect for, for like artists who go on tour because it is a hard life. But like we went to New York, Chicago, DC, Philadelphia, Toronto, um, Atlanta, we went to all these cities. And then we turned around and did an HBCU college tour in that same truck, just going around, allowing people to 
to try the product and um, to experience it and to hear our story of like this beauty that don't, that won't compromise your health or beauty that actually works for your skin tone and showing them imagery. So the beauty industry, like I said earlier, always focused its, its lens on a very specific woman and said like, this is what's beautiful. Um, I think a big part of our growth was us fighting that. So our motto is challenging the beauty standard. And we do just that. So while the world is saying that beauty looks like this, we're doing the complete opposite. So our most, I think, viral campaign to date was with a young lady. Her name is Destiny, but everyone on Instagram knows her as Owawa. And so Owawa is a dark-skinned black woman, um, and she wears like a fade. And so most dark skinned black women believe that they can't wear certain colors. And so I wanted to debunk that myth that if you're of a darker complexion, you can only wear berries and browns. And so we took this woman and we put her on the brightest colors, hot pink, like hot, hot, hot pink, hot purple, um, neon orange. And then we allowed the world to see like, Beauty looks like that, but it also looks like this. So it was like doing things outside of the box that really stood for what we believed in and like reaffirmed our brand messaging. So it's things like the truck. It's things like our imagery that really told the story. Like we just released a cartoon last week, again, just telling the story of our customers, which is something like no beauty company is releasing like a comic strip series, but like, that's something that we, that we do because this is our way of really connecting with our customer. So it's, it's really just like deciding, you know what? I don't have to follow the competition. There's a benefit to being a small business owner that doesn't necessarily come from your industry. So I wasn't a makeup artist. I didn't come from a, a beauty background or a retail background. So I didn't follow those beauty or traditional retail rules. I did whatever it was that I wanted and whatever I thought was cool. I love that. Oh, my God. You have so many things I want to unpack here. First of all, I didn't know about that truck thing. That is amazing. <laughs> so were you literally were you driving the truck around? I like, was driving it. The, wow. the truck is like 26 feet. OK, wow. it's like one of those like big shuttle buses. Like when you go to the airport. And they take you, um, but they use the small ones. So I'm driving this 26 foot <laughs> truck. First of all, I did. I don't even have a chauffeur's license, but I'm a smooth talker. So I, when I went to the Secretary of State, I convinced them to give me a chauffeur's license, and I just figured out how to drive this truck. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm like literally having to jump into the truck and jump out of the truck. Damn, they're falling every time. Because I'm, I'm sure I'm five two. Apparently, think people think I'm tall. I've had a lot of people approach me lately, like, "Oh, you look taller on pictures." I'm like, "Oh, do I? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you." Right. <laughs> so, speaking of the truck now, and, and you know, you talked about when you first started some of the more, um, you know, out the box colors that you came up with over time have you phased out some of those like the blues and the greens to just totally go with demand patterns um not necessarily for demand patterns so it's really about like okay we felt like we conquered that so when we first launched we only had those crazy colors and then over time you know then everybody first of all everybody and their mama came out with a lip a lip color line after that everybody and their mom. And then they started doing like the same colors. And we're like, okay, well, if this is so accessible, then we don't necessarily need to tackle this anymore. Okay. Because again, everything that we do is about challenging the beauty standard and challenging the status quo. So when we launched, you couldn't really find purple or green or blue lipstick. And then two and a half, three years later, everyone was doing that. So we didn't need to do it anymore. Y'all are doing this, so now we're going to go ahead and do something else that, that's good and hot and, and that makes sense for us. Hey guys, it's Nikayla here with a quick word from our sponsors. If you have a business or you know someone who does, you probably know by now that small business owners, we wear a lot of hats. And some of those hats are mad fun, I'm not going to lie. But some of them, like filing taxes and running payroll, they're not so great. That's where Gusto comes in. 
Gusto makes payroll, taxes, and HR actually easy for us small businesses. It's fast with simple payroll processing, benefits, and expert HR support all in one place. Gusto automatically pays and files your federal, state, and local taxes, so you don't have to worry about all that. Plus, they make it easy to add on things like health benefits and even 401ks for your team. So those old school, clunky payroll providers that you probably thought you had to look at, they they just weren't built for the way we work as modern small businesses, but Gusto is. So let them wear all of those hats for you. You have better things to do. Side Hustle Pro listeners, you get three months free when you run your first payroll. So test it out. See for yourself at gusto.com slash SHP. That's gusto.com slash SHP. So, you know, for most of the women I've talked to on this show, there's always that moment where things just start to shift. Can you think of a pivotal moment when sales really start to spike? And if so, what triggered that? Well, I'm sure you've heard this. Like people always say, like, you're not a real business until you're five years in the game. And like, I'm really good, good good friends with the people from Shea Moisture. And they always claim to be a 25 year old startup. But like to us, like to the out the outside world, like we don't really remember Shea Moisture until maybe 10 years ago. So I think it's a combination of when you shop for a brand most of the time you have to have seen that brand before. So it's like, you may have seen it. And then the second time you're like, Oh yeah, I think I've, I think I've heard of the lip bar. And then maybe that third time that you have that interaction with it, then you make that purchase. So I think it's a combination of, we've gotten a ton of press over the last six years. Um, We launched on target.com and then just more recently launched in target stores we were on Shark Tank. So I think it's just like us continuously putting blocks, you know, like climbing that ladder and adding more blocks to like reach this height. So like last year was our most profitable year. We did probably like three times the sales we did the year before. And I think, again, it's just like us being more recognizable and people people connecting and resonating with the brand because we still have tons of people like yeah I've never heard of the lip bar or people saying like yeah I think I saw this on IG but you need that brand recognition and I think it's just something that that we've just kind of gotten over time because we let's be clear the lip bar went the hard way so we've never paid an influencer and like that's what beauty lives off of beauty is completely run by influencer marketing but we don't really like the influencers who use or wear our products. Like we don't pay them. Those are organic relationships. And like they wear and they post about it because that they love it. Like we didn't pay my leak. And then when we found out that my leak then told Kalana Barfield about it, like we were having like a, whoa, this is crazy moment too. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't know that that was happening yeah. or like, Taraji actually just, um, we've, we've made good friends with Taraji's makeup artist who is Ashanta Sharif. And like, so she's been putting the lip bar on Taraji. We don't know that in advance. So this morning we log on to IG and we find out too. And we're like, whoa, that happened. That's cool. So I think it's like just this level of genuine support from people who have like, you know, seen us over the years. Yes. So we don't, it's not, I don't think it's one moment. And I think as a business owner, or even an aspiring business owner, it's very dangerous to think of it in that way. Like it's this one thing that's going to change your business. It's not, it's everything. It's every day putting in the work. And then one day, all of it is going to start coming together and going into the, into the right direction. It's like the book, the alchemist. It's like, what do they say? Um, the universe will start conspiring on your behalf. And I think that's just where we are right now. Yes, yes, that is an important clarification. And thank you for that. It's not that this one thing happened and then boom, it's like you were prepared for the moment. You were prepared for the series of events that eventually led up to more and more traction to ultimately 
you're seeing things like this happen where like it gets into the hands of a major Hollywood actress. But it's not like that changes your life because you are already prepared for that. You already have fabulous things going on and you're ready. You're ready for more people to be aware of it. And that's what yeah. I meant. Yeah. 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 So it's it's nuts and it's it's still very exciting for us to see like we geek out every time. Like we love <laughs> Yvonne Orgy and every time she wears it, we're like, oh, my God. We know that she has a ton of lip bar and she loves it. But every time we wear it, like we don't we don't know. It's not like because we don't have that relationship where it's like, OK, we paid you to post this. We would love for you to use this caption and please <laughs> tag us. So like that's not how we operate. Yes. And, and a bit of that comes out of necessity. Like we probably would have paid an influencer. But if you don't have the money, you have to get creative Mm -hmm. and you have to build that authenticity. And so while influencer marketing is huge, you know, the big companies have essentially priced out the smaller companies. It's like, oh, we're, we're seeing our market share leave. So, you know, we don't want influencers posting about you know, this small business, we only want them to to post about the big guys. So like, that's why you see makeup companies and hair care companies taking people on like flat out vacations. I've seen, I think YSL took someone to like Morocco and it's like a small business can't do that. And so essentially what they're trying to do is price the small guys out. But if you're a small business owner, you shouldn't try to compete in that way because you'll always lose. But compete with what you have and what you have is that authenticity. What you have is the ability to be nimble and to be faster to market. And so use those things. Don't don't try to to compete with someone who has, you know, 20 times your budget. So when did you make the shift back to Detroit and what inspired you to set up a physical location eventually? I moved back to Detroit at the top of 2015. So that is basically year three in business. So I'm originally from Detroit and a couple of things made me move back. The first thing is all while I was living in New York, I was reading stories about Detroit and its ruins and how like this is a fallen city and it's just sad and so much crime and blah, blah, blah. But for me, it was like, but that's home. And I've never really felt And I don't come from a nice neighborhood, but even with with that, I've never really felt unsafe. Nothing has ever happened, you know, to me. So I kind of rejected those stories. But then over time, over like the next couple of years, I started seeing those articles about Detroit change. It went from Detroit's ruins to Detroit is the comeback city and Shinola is building watches and bikes in Detroit and Dan Gilbert owns Detroit and all of these stories. And I was just like, oh wait, it's happening in Detroit and I wanna make sure that people who look like me are a part of it. And then also I had, at at this point, I had quit my job. I was living in New York. I had been focusing on the lip bar full time for maybe a year and a half. And I just decided that I didn't need to to be in New York. I didn't need to bleed money in New York and that ultimately New York didn't need me and I could do a lot more at home. So then after you were in Detroit for some time, when did you decide that you wanted to try expanding beyond just Target Online or even You know, how did you go about getting into Target online and what criteria did you have for prospective retailers when you were thinking of who to align the lip bar with? I decided on Target because everyone loves Target. And so that's how I want people to think about the lip bar. So it's like when you think about Walmart, no one loves Walmart. No one is excited about Walmart, um, but people people Ooh, love that's a controversial Target. statement. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true, though. And, and I would, you know, yeah. in, in several years, we might even launch in in a store like Walmart. But um, Walmart has a very specific clientele that they meet. And it's like that customer is price sensitive and they don't necessarily care as much about the experience. People who shop at Target you know, they enjoy the bright lights. They feel like even though it is an affordable product, that it's going to be high quality. And so I wanted the lip bar to live in a place like that because that's how I think about the brand. Our products are extremely affordable, but they're super high quality. They're vegan. They're cruelty free. We use natural and organic oils as often as possible. 
And we're so affordable because, again, that belief system. So it's like we believe that responsibly made cosmetics shouldn't only be for the privileged. And so when I thought about a store like Target, it was like, okay, well, even though they're selling at this affordable price point, that doesn't necessarily mean that this customer doesn't deserve like a high quality and a high touch experience. So it was it was literally a no brainer for me and I wanted target to be our first partner. And so I reached out to them through a blind email. Wow. So like that's, that's how the opportunity came up. I stalked, I did just stalking on LinkedIn, like trying to find proper email addresses. And I just started emailing people and pitching them. And then one day, you know, the email met the right person and she was like, you know what? This sounds awesome. Can you send me samples? And our packaging is really fancy. So the <laughs> packaging, if you see the packaging and if you try the product, then you're going to give us a shot. But it's like about that visibility. So again, as it relates to like how we started growing, I decided to invest in trade shows because I knew that we needed to get the brand out there. We need we needed that brand recognition with the makeup community. So we started doing like IMATS and the makeup show. And we even did a couple of hair shows. We did BeautyCon. So like those were events that allowed me to get in front of the customer. And so when I thought about like me getting in front of the customer, then I started thinking about um, from the opposite end, like, OK, well, how do I get to my customer on a massive scale? And I felt like Target was, you know, that answer. I love that. I love the fact that you did a cold email. I try to tell people you have to get into stalking. You have to get into stalking people on LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> that is especially, the way. Especially yeah. if you don't have the network and yes. the access. And a lot of people don't, especially people of color, don't have the access or or the network. So you have to create it for yourself. Mm-hmm. And that said, you have to come correct with your pitch. So, you know, it's clear that you did. It's clear that you did. So what a year 2018 has been. What has changed in your business model since expanding into Target? Um, Well, I think the biggest thing, and I don't think it's just Target. I think it's just like what marketing looks like. I'm now stepping into the brand for years. I hid behind the brand. I didn't want to be the face of it. I didn't want to be at the forefront. I really? didn't want to, I didn't want Melissa to be synonymous with the lip bar. I wanted it to be Melissa Butler and I wanted the lip bar to be the lip bar, but it's literally impossible. And so I've now embraced being at the forefront of the brand and being the face of the brand and being like that spokesperson. But yeah, I I definitely did not want to be there. I'm pretty private and I'm not good at social media. And you have to be so strategic with social media. And so now that I am like at the forefront of the brand, I find myself even today, like addicted to Instagram. Like my thumb is consistently finding its way to the app when I'm supposed to be productive. And then I'm like, okay, first of all, you need to delete this and you need to focus (laughs) because this is not going to pay the bills. So yeah, being, being the face was, is a major shift. Okay. Social media can be a little difficult because it breeds this need to be validated. And so I didn't, I didn't really want that. I didn't want to create that monster. So that's, that's a part of the reason why. And I don't need validation, but I understand how comparison is the thief of joy. And if you're constantly on social media and looking at how other people live their lives, you'll immediately internalize that. So I didn't want that. So before I started like deciding that I would walk into the lip bar a little bit more, I would only post on social media like once every three months. It was ridiculous. I didn't, I didn't really care. It was, it was, people are like, what? Like, do you even have an Instagram? Uh, right, but now I'm like, like once every two weeks. Yeah. I can't imagine a world at the same time. I get it. And as someone who, whose audience has grown significantly through using Instagram, it's something I, I am learning how to balance because it is a time suck. You can easily scroll for hours. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's bad. So, you know, before we jump into the lightning round, Can you share some of the blunders that you've made along the way? And, you know, second part to that is also how do you handle rejection? You know, we're not going to dwell on the Shark Tank experience because I honestly hate when people just bring that up so much. But I very much admire you for being able to kind of like 
keep it moving as you deal with rejection and you just, you know, keep pushing your brand forward and, you know, look how it served you. So what advice can you share about that? I approach life and this isn't even just like a business thing, but I approach life um, in a way where it's like, I don't get really hung up on the losses, but also I don't really celebrate the wins as much. Like I'm pretty much even, it's almost like I expect the wins and like when the losses happen, I just immediately go into problem solving mode. And so, for instance, like the Shark Tank thing, like that was a very public rejection, but it didn't stop me because ultimately I started thinking about, okay, well, why did this happen? And my immediate thought was, oh, because this wasn't your audience. And so I'm not going to allow someone who knows nothing about my business, who is not my audience to then determine or be the authority on my dreams or on my future. So I think as a business owner, you, first of all, you absolutely have to have thick skin and you have to understand your why, because unless you have such a strong idea and foundation of why you're doing that, then anything will stop you because you're going to hear no a thousand times. So, I mean, I pretty much accept blunders as a part of it. It's like, I know that things are going to go wrong. And instead of, of harping on it, I'm immediately like, okay, well, Number one, what caused it? And then how do we prevent this from happening again? And if this is something that we can mitigate to prevent it from like boiling over, then, OK, great. Let's go into like response mode. And I think that's just how you have to approach it because you, you can't mourn the losses for too long because business keeps moving. Time keeps moving. They're all, there's always going to be another need. So while you're sulking in the corner, you know, there are other opportunities that are potentially missed. Yes. Oh, I love that. All righty. Um, now we're going to transition into the lightning round, which is basically I just ask five quick questions and you answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? OK. All righty. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? The one thing I don't, it's a book, it's called The One Thing. I don't remember who wrote it, but I'm sure it's easy to Google. But as an entrepreneur, you have to prioritize, especially if you don't have like a, a big team to help you. So that book helped me tremendously, like basically recalibrate my mindset and on prioritizing. Yes. So I read it. Love that one. OK, number two, who is a black woman entrepreneur that you would want to trade places with for a day and why? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> the CEO of Uber. Oh, well, you mean the VP of the brand marketing? Yes. Yes. yes the brand Bazoma, marketing. Bazoma St. John. Yes. Oh, yes. OK. I feel bad because I don't even know her name. But we know her presence. We know her We, know, we yes. know her presence. <laughs> and I would trade places with her because tech is such a male dominated industry. And I just want to know how she moves in those spaces and like how the world receives her in those spaces. Yes. All righty. Number three, what is a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Um, drinking tea. I know it sounds weird, but it levels me out. It gives me like a time to quiet down and and tame my thoughts. OK, number four, what is a productivity hack that you can share with us so we can all not scroll on Instagram for hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there is an app called Flora. And so Flora is basically, it's like you, you building a tree. And so it's an app, you log on, you set your timer. It can be 25 minutes, 30 minutes. It's, it can be an hour. And basically that tree is growing. It goes from a seed to a fully bloomed tree within that time frame. But if you get out of that app, it immediately will tell you like, oh, you don't want your tree to die because if you're out of that app for more than three seconds, your tree will die and it, basically you fail at productivity. So it's the idea of you not being as addicted to your phone. And I know it's tough because a lot of people work on their phones, but also, we get distracted on our phones. So like I have recently turned like I have a MacBook and I've recently turned the notifications in the corner off because if your eyes are constantly getting distracted by, by messages or emails, you may not be able to work on that strategy or just accomplish that goal. So I, I find that 
working in spurts and giving yourself time to break is way more productive. So I'll work for 30 minutes straight and then give myself like a five or 10 minute break and then get back to work. And then I find myself as like my time is dwindling down. I like try to rush to meet my goal to finish that particular project before my time is out. Mm, I like that. I've never heard of that. app. Yeah. It's like competing with yourself. I love it. I'm going to look it up and definitely link to it in the show notes. Okay. Finally, what is your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to leave that day job, but are worried about losing the steady paycheck? First of all, know, know who you are. And I mean that like, know what you're spending your money on while also like understand that you're going to have to make some sacrifices. So look at your finances and decide like what's a necessity because I, I wouldn't recommend you taking away things that you love or or you're going to resent, you know, that side that side hustle that you're trying to accomplish. So if you know that your favorite thing is going to brunch on Saturday mornings, maybe you can't go every Saturday morning, but I definitely wouldn't recommend you saying like, oh, I can't go to brunch anymore, period, because then you put yourself in a corner and then you basically associate entrepreneurship with the very thing that you were trying to create. So like, it's like that loss of freedom. So definitely think very carefully about your finances, but also think about who you are and then figure out your budget from there and then create this plan. So you can't just quit your job. Like I said, I thought I saved a year's worth of my expenses. I think it only lasted seven or eight months, but figure out how much how much you need and then what's the worst that could happen. I knew that if I quit my job and worked on the lit bar, but ultimately if the lit bar failed, I was still fine. But I was in that position. So you definitely want to like think of the pros and cons and think about your flexibility and then definitely go for it. I definitely wouldn't say, you know, don't do it because you you definitely want to live a life without regret. So it may take a little bit longer and don't beat yourself up about it. Like use your job for what it is. Like collect those checks, save your money, like go there and do what you need to do. But, you know, you can't really um, without that plan in place, that financial plan, then you'll resent that job. But if you know, like, oh, okay, when I save fifteen thousand dollars, I'm out of here then you're going to appreciate that job a little bit more. And then you won't go in there miserable every day because you'll be going there with a purpose. Perfect, perfect note to end on. So, Melissa, what's the best way that listeners can connect with you after this episode? Um, well, of course, I want you guys to follow The Lip Bar on Instagram. It's just at The Lip Bar. Or if you're on Facebook or Twitter, it's the same, at The Lip Bar. And then my personal page is Melissa R. Butler. So, you know, send me a, a holler on Instagram when I go on there once every three weeks, when I when it's not <laughs> deleted, <laughs> when I'm not in time out for being too addicted. Come, come in, give me a holler. Oh, okay amazing well melissa thank you so much for joining us in the guest chair today thank you thank you so much for having me hey hey thanks for listening now stay connected in between episodes by texting side hustle pro to 44222 you'll get my weekly six bullet saturday newsletters where i share what i'm up to what i'm reading my business tip of the week and resources to help you grow your side hustle. And I'm working behind the scenes on some live events, which my email list will get access to first. So make sure you're in the loop. Text Side Hustle Pro to 44222 or visit sidehustlepro.co slash SBS.